Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. You know, I had an entire speech prepared for this wonderful occasion. But now that I'm here, I think I'm going to try something a little different. Tonight, I want to speak from the heart. I'm going to speak off the cuff. Good evening. <laughs> Pause for laughter. <laughs> Wait a minute. This may not be working as well as I. Let me try that again. Good evening, everybody. I, I would like to welcome you all to the 10 day anniversary of my first 100 days. <laughs> I am Barack Obama. Most of you covered me. All of you voted for me. <laughs> Apologies to the Fox table. There were. I have to confess I really did not want to be here tonight, but I knew I had to come. Just one more problem that I've inherited from George W. Bush. <laughs> but now that I'm here, it's great to be here. It's great to see all of you. Michelle Obama is here, First Lady of the United States. Hasn't she been an outstanding First Lady? She's even begun to bridge the difference, differences that have divided us for so long, because no matter which party you belong to, we can all agree that uh, Michelle has the right to bear arms. <laughs> now, Sasha and Malia aren't here tonight because they're grounded. You can't just take Air Force One on a joyride to Manhattan. I don't care whose kids you are. We've been setting some ground rules here. They're starting to get a little carried away. And now, uh, speak, when I think about children, obviously I think about Michelle, uh, and it reminds me that tomorrow is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the audience. I do have to say, though, that uh, this is a tough holiday for Rahm Emanuel uh, because he's not uh, used to saying the word day after mother. <laughs> That's true. David Axelrod is here. You know, David and I have been, been together for a long time. I, I can still remember. It, 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 I get a sort of a little bit. When I, when I think back to that day that I called Ax uh, so many years ago and said, you and I can do wonderful things together. And he said to me the same thing that partners all across America are saying to one another right now. Let's go to Iowa and make it official. <laughs> Michael Steele is in the house tonight. Or as he would say, in the heezy. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Where is Michael? Is he, uh, Michael, for the last time, the Republican Party does not qualify for a bailout. Rush Limbaugh does not count as a troubled asset. I'm sorry. <laughs> D 
Dick Cheney was supposed to be here, uh, but he is very busy working on his memoirs, tentatively titled How to Shoot Friends and Interrogate People. It's been a whirlwind of activity uh, these first hundred days. We've enacted a major e economic recovery package. We, we passed a budget. We forged a new path in Iraq. And no president in history has ever named three commerce secretaries this quickly. <laughs> uh, which reminds me, if, if Judd Gregg is, is here, uh, your business cards are ready now. On top of that, I've also reversed the ban on stem cell research, signed an expansion, <laughs> signed an expansion to children's health insurance. Just last week, car and driver named me Auto Executive of the Year. <laughs> Something I'm very proud of. We've also begun to, to change the culture in Washington. We've even made the White House a place where people can learn and can grow. Just recently, Larry Summers asked if he could chair the White House Council on Women and Girls. <laughs> and I do appreciate uh, that Larry's here tonight because it is seven hours past his bedtime. <laughs> Gives like that one. <laughs> In the last hundred days, we've also grown the Democratic Party by infusing it with new energy and bringing in fresh young faces like Arlen Specter. <laughs> uh, Joe Biden uh, rightly deserves a lot of credit for convincing uh, Arlen to make the switch. Uh, but Secretary Clinton actually had a lot to do with it, too. Uh, one day she just pulled him aside and she said, Arlen, you know what I always say, if you can't beat him, join him. <laughs> which, which brings me to another thing that's changed in, in this new, warmer, fuzzier White House. Uh, and that's my relationship with Hillary. Uh, you know, we had been rivals during the campaign. But these days, we could not be closer. In fact, uh, the second she got back from Mexico, she pulled me into a hug and gave me a big kiss, <laughs> told me I better get down there myself, which I really appreciated. I mean, it was, it was nice. <laughs> and of course, we've also begun to change America's image in the world. We talked about this during this campaign, and, and we're starting to execute. We've renewed alliances with important partners and friends. If, I, if you look on the screen there, there I am with Japanese Prime Minister Tarasso. Uh, there I am with, with Gordon Brown. Uh, but as I said during the campaign, we can't just talk to our friends. As hard as it is, we also have to talk to our enemies. And I've begun to do exactly that. Take a look at the monitor there. <laughs> Let me be clear, just because he handed me a copy of Peter Pan does not mean that I'm going to read it, but that's, that's good diplomatic practice to just accept these gifts. All this change hasn't been easy. Change never is. So I've cut the tension by bringing a new friend to the White House. He's warm, he's cuddly, loyal, enthusiastic. You just have to keep him on a tight leash. Every, every once in a while, he goes charging off in the wrong direction and gets himself into trouble. But uh, enough about Joe Biden. <laughs> all in all, we're proud of the change we've brought to Washington in these first 100 days. But we've got a lot of work left to do, as all of you know. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what my administration plans to achieve in the next 100 days. During the second 100 days, we will design, build, 
and open a library dedicated to my first 100 days. <laughs> it's going to be big. In the next 100 days, I will learn to go off the prompter, and Joe Biden will learn to stay on the prompter. <laughs> In the next 100 days, our bipartisan outreach will be so successful that even John Boehner will consider becoming a Democrat. <laughs> After all, we have a lot of, in common. He is a person of color, <laughs> although not a color that appears in the natural world. <laughs> What's up, John? <laughs> In the next 100 days, I will meet with a leader who rules over millions with an iron fist, who owns the airwaves and uses his power to crush all who would challenge his authority at the ballot box. It's good to see you, Mayor Bloomberg. <laughs> In the next hundred days, we will house train our dog bowl. Because the last thing Tim Geithner needs is someone else treating him like a fire hydrant. <laughs> In the next hundred days, I will strongly consider losing my cool. <laughs> Finally, I believe that my next 100 days will be so successful, I will be able to complete them in 72 days. <laughs> and on the 73rd day, I will rest. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I want to end by saying a few words uh, about the men and women in this room uh, whose job it is to inform the public and pursue the truth. And we meet tonight at a, a moment of extraordinary challenge uh, for this nation and for the world. But it's also a time of real hardship for the field of journalism. And like so many other businesses in this global age, you've seen sweeping changes in technology and communications uh, that lead to a sense of uncertainty and anxiety about what the future will hold. Across the country, there are extraordinary, hardworking journalists who have lost their jobs in recent days, recent weeks, we, recent months. And I know that each newspaper and media outlet is wrestling with how to respond to these changes. And some are struggling simply to stay open. And it won't be easy. Uh, not every ending will be a happy one. But it's also true that your ultimate success as an industry is essential to the success of our democracy. It's what makes this thing work. Now, Thomas Jefferson once said that if he had the choice between a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, he would not hesitate to choose the latter. And clearly, Thomas Jefferson never had cable news to contend with. <laughs> but his central point remains. A government without newspapers, a government without a tough and vibrant media of all sorts is not an option for the United States of America. So, I may not, I may not agree with everything you write uh, or report. I may even complain, or more likely Gibbs will complain, from time to time about how you do your jobs. But I do so with the knowledge that when you are at your best, then you help me be at my best. You help all of us who serve at the pleasure of the American people do our jobs better by holding us accountable, by demanding honesty, by preventing us from taking shortcuts and falling into easy political games that people are so desperately weary of. And that kind of reporting is worth preserving, not just for your sake, but for the public's. We count on you to help us make sense of a complex world and tell the stories of our lives uh, the way they happen. And we look for you uh, for truth, even if uh, it's always an approximation, even if... <laughs> <laughs> don't, 
This is a season of renewal and reinvention. That is what government must learn to do. That's what businesses must learn to do. And that's what journalism is in the process of doing. And when I look out at this room and think about the dedicated men and women whose questions I've answered over the last few years, I know that for all the challenges this industry faces, it's not short on talent or creativity or passion or commitment. It's not short of young people who are eager to break news or the not so young who still manage to ask the tough ones time and time again. These qualities alone will not solve all your problems, but they certainly prove that the problems are worth solving. And that is a good place as any uh, to begin. So I offer you my thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Please, please have a seat. Thank you so much, Ed, uh, and to all the other board members, uh, to honored guests, and to the lovely First Lady. Good evening. You know, Ed's right. Uh, I work a lot. And so I wasn't sure that I should actually come tonight. Biden talked me into it. <laughs> he leaned over and he said, Mr. President, <laughs> this is no ordinary dinner. This is a big <laughs> meal. It's been quite a year since I've uh, spoken here last. Lots of ups, lots of downs, except for my approval ratings, which have just gone down. <laughs> but that's politics. It doesn't bother me. Besides, I happen to know that my approval ratings are still very high in the country of my birth. <laughs> so. And then just the other day, my dear friend, Hillary Clinton, pulled me aside and she gave me a pep talk. She said, despite the numbers, she said, don't worry, Barack, you're likable enough. <laughs> Which made me feel better. Of course, I may not have had the star power that I once had, but in my defense, neither do all of you. <laughs> People say to me, Mr. President, you helped revive the banking industry. You've saved GM and Chrysler. What about the news business? And I, t <laughs> I have to explain, hey, I I'm just the president. I'm not, uh, I'm not a miracle worker here. <laughs> Though I am glad that the only person whose ratings uh, fell more than mine last year is here tonight. Great to see you, Jay. I'm also glad that I'm speaking first, uh, because uh, we've all seen what happens when uh, somebody takes the time slot after Leno's. <laughs> by the way, all of the jokes here tonight are brought uh, to you by our friends at Goldman Sachs. So you don't have to worry. Uh, they make money whether you laugh or not. <laughs> we do have uh, a number of notable guests uh, in attendance here tonight. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm most pleased uh, that Michelle accompanied me. She doesn't always go to these things. And there are, 
There are a few things in life that are harder to find and more important to keep than love. Uh, well, love and a birth certificate. <laughs> the Jonas Brothers are here. They're out there somewhere. Sasha and Malia are huge fans. But uh, boys don't get any ideas. I have two words for you. Predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. You think I'm joking? Uh, speaking of tween heartthrobs, Scott Brown is here. I... I admire Scott, rare politician in Washington with nothing to hide. <laughs> now, you should be aware that Scott Brown is not the only one with a salacious photo spread floating around. Recently, David Axelrod was offered a centerfold opportunity of his own. <laughs> now, I did not know that Krispy Kreme had a catalog. but. It's true. I saw Michael Steele uh, backstage when we were taking pictures, a.k.a. Notorious GOP. <laughs> Michael, who knows what truly plagues America today, taxation without representing. My brother. <laughs> I did a similar routine last year, but it always works. <laughs> Odds are that the Salahis are here. <laughs> there haven't been people that were more unwelcome at a party since Charlie Crist. <laughs> Unfortunately, John McCain couldn't make it. Recently, he claimed that he had never identified himself as a maverick. And we all know what happens in Arizona when you don't have ID. <laughs> Adios, amigos. Look, I feel for John. You know, we were on the road together and, and uh, obviously had a hard-fought battle. And, and you learn, certainly at the national level, politics isn't easy. Uh, you know, this year I've, I've experienced my share of disappointments. Um, for example, I had my heart set on the Nobel Prize for physics. <laughs> but, hey, you can't win them all. Speaking of undeserved honors, uh, a few weeks ago, I was able to throw out the first pitch at the Nationals game. And I don't know if you saw it, but I threw it a little high, a little outside. Uh, this is how uh, Fox News covered it. Right, right here. <laughs> President panders to extreme left wing of batter box. <laughs> On the other hand, MSNBC had a different take. President pitches no hitter. <laughs> and then CNN went a different way altogether. I was just asking, you know, there. I guess that's why they're the most trusted name in news. <laughs> Now look, I, I have a reputation for giving uh, cable a hard time, so let's pick on political for a while. 
you know, uh, people attack Politico for putting a new focus on trivial issues, political fodder, gossip sheet. That's not fair. Politico's been doing this for centuries now. <laughs> Just check out these headlines. Uh, our researchers found these. Japan surrenders, where's the bounce? <laughs> then there's this one. Uh, Lincoln saves Union, but can he save House Majority? <laughs> I don't know if you can see, that there's a little portion there. Uh, he's lost the Southern white vote. <laughs> it's a studious analysis there. Uh, and my favorite? Uh, July 3rd, uh, 1776, senior Whig official, talks break down, independence dead. <laughs> so this is nothing new. But even though uh, the mainstream press uh, gives me a hard time, uh, I hear that I'm still pretty big on Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, or as Sarah Palin calls it, the socialized media. <laughs> of course, that's not the only thing that we've been accused of socializing this year. Uh, you might have heard we, we passed a health care bill. And Was that Roger Ailes applauding out there? <laughs> Some Republicans have suggested that the bill contains a few secret provisions. Now that's ridiculous. There aren't a few secret provisions in the health care plan. There are, are like hundreds. <laughs> uh, tonight, in the interest of transparency, I'd like to share a couple. Uh, let's see. This provision is called the Bay State of Denial. It reads, this bill shall cover short-term memory loss related to the passage of Massachusetts health care reform. <laughs> so good news, Mitt, your condition is covered. <laughs> this next provision is called the Jersey Shore Up. It reads, the following individual shall be excluded from the indoor tanning tax within this bill. <laughs> Snooky, Jay Wow, The Situation, and House Minority Leader John Boehner. <laughs> this provision ought to put a common misconception to rest. It says right here, if you do not like the ruling of your death panel, you can appeal. <laughs> now, look, obviously I've learned this year politics can be a tough business, but uh, there are times where you just can't help but laugh. Uh, you know what really tickles me? Eric Massa. <laughs> Uh, uh, apparently, Massa claimed that Rom came up to him one day in the House locker room, stark naked, started screaming obscenities at him, to which I say, welcome to my world. I feel you. It's, it's a tense moment. You know, even as we enjoy each other's company tonight, uh, we're also mindful of the incredible struggles of our fellow Americans in the Gulf Coast, uh, both those leading the efforts to stem this crisis and those along the coast whose livelihoods are in jeopardy uh, as a result of the spill. Also in our thoughts and prayers tonight are the men and women in uniform who put their lives at risk each and every day for our safety and freedom.
So in that, in that spirit, I'd also like to pay a tribute to the journalists who play an extraordinary role in telling their stories. You know, earlier today, I gave the commencement address at Michigan, where I spoke to the graduates about what is required to keep our democracy thriving in the 21st century. And one of the points I made is that for all the changes and challenges facing your industry, this country absolutely needs a healthy, vibrant medium. Probably needs it more than ever now. Today's technology, today's technology has made it possible for us to get our news and information from a growing range of sources. We can pick and choose not only our preferred type of media, but also our preferred perspective. And while that exposes us to an unprecedented array of opinions and analysis and points of view, it also makes it that much more important that we're all operating on a common baseline of facts. It makes it that much more important that journalists out there seek only the truth. And I don't have to tell you that. Some of you are seasoned veterans who have been on the political beat for decades. Others here tonight began their careers as bloggers not long ago. But I think it's fair to say that every single reporter in this room believes deeply in the enterprise of journalism. Every one of you, even the most cynical among you, understands and cherishes the function of a free press in the preservation of our system of government and of our way of life. And I want you to know that for all the jokes and the occasional gripes, uh, I cherish that work as well. In fact, tonight I wanted to present all of you with a bipartisan congressional resolution that honors all those wonderful contributions that journalists have made to our country and the world. Uh, but unfortunately, I couldn't break the filibuster. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. My fellow Americans, Mahalo. <laughs> it is wonderful to be here at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. What a week. As some of you heard, the state of Hawaii released my official long-form birth certificate. Hopefully, that this puts all doubts to rest. But just in case there are any lingering questions, tonight, I'm prepared to go a step further. Tonight, for the first time, I am releasing my official birth video. Now, I warn you, no one has seen this footage in 50 years, not even me. But uh, let's take a look. Oh well, back to square one. I, I, I want to make clear to the Fox News table, that was a joke. Um, that was not my real birth video. That was a children's cartoon. 
Call Disney if you don't believe me. They have the original long form version. Anyway, it's good to be back with so many esteemed guests, celebrities, senators, journalists, essential government employees, <laughs> non-essential government employees. You know who you are. I am very much looking forward to hearing Seth Meyer tonight. He, uh, He's a young, fresh face who can do no wrong in the eyes of his fans. Seth, and enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> yes, I think it is fair to say that when it comes to my presidency, the honeymoon is over. For example, some people now suggest that I'm too professorial, and I'd like to address that head on by assigning all of you some reading that will help you draw your own conclusions. <laughs> Others say that I'm arrogant, but I found a really great self-help tool for this, my poll numbers. <laughs> I've even let down my key core constituency movie stars. <laughs> Just the other day, Matt Damon. I, I love Matt Damon. <laughs> love the guy. Matt Damon said he was disappointed in my performance. Well, Matt, I just saw the Adjustment Bureau, so <laughs> right back at you, buddy. Of course, there's someone who I can always count on for support, my wonderful wife, Michelle. We made a terrific team at the Easter Egg Roll this week. I'd give out bags of candy to the kids, and she'd snatch them right back out of their little hands. <laughs> Snatched them. <laughs> and uh, where's the national public radio table? You guys are still here. That's good. I couldn't remember where we landed on that. I know you were a little tense when the GOP tried to cut your funding, but personally, I was looking forward to new programming, like No Things Considered, <laughs> or Wait, Wait, Don't Fund Me. <laughs> of course, the deficit is a serious issue. That's why Paul Ryan couldn't be here tonight. Uh, his budget has no room for laughter. Michelle Bachman is here, though, I understand, uh, and she is thinking about running for president, which is weird because I hear she was born in Canada. <laughs> yes, Michelle, this is how it starts. <laughs> Tim Pawlenty. He seems all-American, but if you heard his real middle name, Tim Hosni Palenti, <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> My buddy, our outstanding ambassador, John Huntsman, is with us. Now, there's something you might not know about John. Uh, he didn't learn to speak Chinese to go there. Oh, no. 
He learned English to come here. And then there's a vicious rumor floating around that I think could really hurt Mitt Romney. I heard he passed universal health care when he was governor of Massachusetts. <laughs> Someone should get to the bottom of that. And I know just the guy to do it. Donald Trump <laughs> is here tonight. Now, I know that he's taken some flack lately, but no one is happier, no one is prouder to put this birth certificate matter to rest than the Donald. And that's because he can finally get back to focusing on the issues that matter. Like, did we fake the moon landing? What really happened in Roswell? And where are Biggie and Tupac? All kidding aside, obviously we all know about your credentials and breadth of experience. Um, for example, uh, no, seriously, just recently, in an episode of Celebrity Apprentice, at the steakhouse, the men's cooking team uh, did not impress the judges from Omaha Steaks. And there was a lot of blame to go around, but you, Mr. Trump, recognized that the real problem was a lack of leadership. And so ultimately, you didn't blame Little John or Meatloaf. You fired Gary Busey. And these are the kind of decisions that would keep me up at night. Well handled, sir. Well handled. Say what you will about uh, Mr. Trump. He certainly would bring some change to the White House. Let's see what we've got up there. So, yes, this has been quite a year in politics, uh, but also in the movies. Many people, for instance, were inspired by The King's Speech. <laughs> Wonderful film. Well, some of you may not know this, but there's now a sequel in the works that touches close to home. And because this is a Hollywood crowd, uh, tonight I can offer a sneak peek so can we uh, show the trailer, please? Coming to a theater near you. Uh, let me close on a serious note. Uh, we are having a good time, but um, as has been true for the last several years, uh, we have incredible young men and women uh, who are serving in uniform uh, overseas in the most extraordinary of circumstances, and we, we are reminded of their courage and their valor. We also need to remember uh, our neighbors in Alabama and across the South that have been devastated by terrible storms from last week. Uh, Michelle and I were down there yesterday, uh, and we spent a lot of time with some of the folks who have been affected. Uh, the devastation is unimaginable and is heartbreaking. And it's going to be a long road back. And so we need to keep those Americans in our thoughts and in our prayers. But we also need to stand with them in the hard months and perhaps years to come. I intend to make sure that the federal government does that. And I've got faith that the journalists in this room will do their part for the people who have been affected by this disaster by reporting on their progress and letting the rest of America know uh, when they will need more help. Those are stories that need telling. 
And that's what all of you do best, whether it's rushing to the site of a devastating storm in Alabama or braving danger to cover a revolution in the Middle East. You know, in the last months, we've seen journalists threatened, arrested, beaten, attacked, and in some cases even killed, simply for doing their best to bring us the story, to give people a voice, and to hold leaders accountable. And through it all, we've seen daring men and women risk their lives for the simple idea that no one should be silenced, and everyone deserves to know the truth. That's what you do. At your best, that's what journalism is. That's the principle that you uphold. It is always important, but it's especially important in times of challenge, like the moment that America and the world is facing now. So I thank you for your service and the contributions that you make. And I want to close by recognizing not only your service, uh, but also uh, to remember uh, those that have been lost uh, as a consequence of the extraordinary reporting uh, that they've done uh, over recent weeks. Uh, they help, too, to defend our freedoms and allow democracy to flourish. God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I could not be more thrilled to be here tonight at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. This is a great crowd. They're already laughing. It's terrific. Chuck Todd, love your brother. I'm delighted to see some of the cast members of Glee are here. And Jimmy Kimmel. It's an honor, man. That's so fun. Um, my fellow Americans, we gather during a historic anniversary. Last year at this time, in fact, on this very weekend, we finally delivered justice to one of the world's most notorious individuals. Now this year, we gather in the midst of a heated election season, and Axelrod tells me I should never miss a chance to reintroduce myself to the American people. So tonight, this is how I'd like to begin. My name is Barack Obama. My mother was born in Kansas. My father was born in Kenya, and I was born of course, in Hawaii. In 2009, I took office in the face of some enormous challenges. Now, some have said I blame too many problems on my predecessor, but let's not forget that's a practice that was initiated by George W. Bush. Since then, Congress and I have certainly had our differences, uh, yet I've tried to be civil, to not take any cheap shots. Uh, and that's why uh, I want to especially thank all the members who took a break from their exhausting schedule of not passing any laws to be here tonight. <laughs> Let's give them a big round of applause. Despite many obstacles, uh, much has changed during my time in office. Four years ago, I was locked in a brutal primary battle with Hillary Clinton. Four years later, she won't stop drunk texting me from Cartagena.
Four years ago, I was a Washington outsider. Four years later, I'm at this dinner. Four years ago, I looked like this. Today, I look like this. And four years from now, I will look like this. That's not even funny. <laughs> anyway, it's great to be here this evening in the vast, magnificent Hilton Ballroom, or what Mitt Romney would call a little fixer-upper. I mean, look at this party. We got men in tuxes, women in gowns, fine wine, first class entertainment. I was just relieved to learn this was not a GSA conference. <laughs> Unbelievable. Not even the mind reader knew what they were thinking. Of course, the White House Correspondents' Dinner is known as the prom of Washington, D.C., a, a term coined by political reporters who clearly never had the chance to go to an actual prom. <laughs> Our chaperone for the evening is Jimmy Kimmel. who is perfect for the job since most of tonight's audience is in his key demographic, people who fall asleep during Nightline. <laughs> Jimmy got his start years ago on The Man Show. In Washington, that's what we call a congressional hearing on contraception. Plenty of journalists are here tonight. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't congratulate the Huffington Post on their Pulitzer Prize. You deserve it, Ariana. There's no one else out there linking to the kinds of hard-hitting journalism that HuffPo is linking to every single day. Give them a round of applause. And you don't pay them, it's a great business model. Even Sarah Palin's getting back into the game. Guest hosting on the Today Show, which reminds me uh, of an old saying. What's the difference between a hockey mom and a pit bull? A pit bull is delicious. <laughs> a little soy sauce. <laughs> I know at this point many of you are expecting me to go after my likely opponent, Newt Gingrich. <laughs> Newt, there's still time, man. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to attack any of the Republican candidates. Take Mitt Romney. He and, I, he and I actually have a lot in common. We both think of our wives as our better halves. And polls show to a uh, alarmingly insulting extent the American people agree. <laughs> we also both have degrees from Harvard. I have one. He has two. What a snob. <laughs> Thank you. 
Of course, we've also had our differences. Recently, his campaign criticized me for slow jamming the news with Jimmy Fallon. In fact, I understand Governor Romney was so incensed, he asked his staff if he could get some equal time on the Merv Griffin show. <laughs> Still, I guess Governor Romney is feeling pretty good about things because uh, he took a few hours off the other day to see The Hunger Games. Some of you have seen it. It's a movie about people who court wealthy sponsors and then brutally savage each other until only one contestant is left standing. I'm sure this was a really great change of pace for him. I have not seen The Hunger Games. Not enough class warfare for me. Of course, I know everybody's predicting a nasty election, and, and thankfully, uh, we've all agreed that families are off limits. Dogs, however, are apparently fair game. <laughs> and while both campaigns have had some fun with this, uh, the other day, uh, I saw a new ad from one of these outside groups that, uh, frankly, I think crossed the line. I know Governor Romney says he has no control over what his super PACs do, but uh, can, can we show the ad real quick? That's pretty rough, <laughs> but I can take it because my stepfather always told, told me it's a boy dog world out there. Now, if I do win a second term as president, let me just say something to all the let me just say something to all my conspiracy-oriented friends uh, on the right who think I'm planning to unleash some secret agenda. You're absolutely right. <laughs> so allow me to close with a quick preview of the secret agenda you can expect in a second Obama administration. In my first term, I sang Al Green. In my second term, I'm going with young Jeezy. <laughs> Michelle said, yeah. I sing that to her sometimes. In my first term, we ended the war in Iraq. In my second term, I will win the war on Christmas. <laughs> in my first term, we repealed the policy known as Don't Ask, Don't Tell. In <coughs> Wait, though. In my second term, we will replace it with a policy known as It's Raining Men. In my first term, we passed health care reform. In my second term, I guess I'll pass it again. <laughs> I, do, I do want to end tonight on a slightly more serious note. Uh, whoever takes uh, the oath of office next January will face some great challenges, uh, but he will also inherit traditions that make us greater than the challenges we face. And one of those traditions is represented here tonight, a free press that isn't afraid to ask questions, to examine, and to criticize. And in service of that mission, all of you make sacrifices. Uh, tonight we remember journalists such as Anthony Shadid uh, and Marie Colvin. who made the ultimate sacrifice because they, they sought to shine a light on some of the most important stories of our time. So whether you are a blogger or a broadcaster, whether you take uh, 
on powerful interests here at home or put yourself in harm's way overseas. Uh, I have the greatest respect and admiration for what you do. Uh, I know sometimes you like to give me a hard time, uh, and I certainly like to return the favor. Uh, but I never forget that our country depends on you. Uh, you help protect our freedom, our democracy, and our way of life. Uh, and just to set the record straight, I really do enjoy attending these dinners. Uh, in fact, I had a lot more material prepared, but uh, I have to get the Secret Service home in time for their new curfew. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. No entrance music. Uh, Rush Limbaugh warned you about this. Second term, baby. <laughs> We're changing things around here a little bit. <laughs> Actually, my advisors were a little worried about uh, the new rap entrance music. They are a little more traditional. They suggested that I should start with some jokes at my own expense, just to take myself down a peg. I was like, guys, after four and a half years, how many pegs are there left? <laughs> I want to thank the White House correspondents. Ed, you're doing an outstanding job. Uh, we are grateful for the great work you've done. Uh, to all uh, the dignitaries who are here, uh, everybody uh, on the dais, I especially want to uh, say thank you to Ray Ordierno, who does outstanding service on behalf of our country, and all our men and women in uniform every single day. And of course, uh, our extraordinary First Lady, Michelle Obama. Everybody loves Michelle. She's on the cover of Vogue, high poll numbers, but don't worry, I recently got my own magazine cover. Now, I, look, I, I get it. These days I look in the mirror and I have to admit, I'm not the strapping young Muslim socialist that I used to be. <laughs> Time passes, get a little gray. And yet, even after all this time, I still make rookie mistakes. Like I'm out in California, we're at a fundraiser, we're having a nice time. I happen to mention that Kamala Harris is the best looking attorney general in the country. As you might imagine, I got trouble when I got back home. Who knew Eric Holder was so sensitive? And then there's the Easter egg roll, which is supposed to be just a nice fun event with the kids. I go out on the basketball court, took 22 shots, made two of them. That's right, two hits, 20 misses. The executives at NBC asked, what's your secret? So, yes, maybe I have lost a step. But some things are beyond my control. For example, this whole controversy about Jay-Z going to Cuba. It's unbelievable. I've got 99 problems and now Jay-Z's won. <laughs> That's another rap reference, Bill. <laughs> Of course, everybody's got plenty of advice. Maureen Dowd said, I could solve all my problems if I were just more like Michael Douglas in The American President. <laughs> and I know Michael's here tonight. 
Uh, Michael, what's your secret, man? <laughs> Could it be that you were an actor in an Aaron Sorkin liberal fantasy? <laughs> Might that have something to do with it? I don't know. Check in with me. Maybe, maybe that it's something else. <laughs> Anyway, I recognize that this job can take a toll on you. I understand second term, need a burst of new energy, try some new things. And then my team and I talked about it. We were willing to try anything. So we borrowed one of Michelle's tricks. I thought this looked pretty good, but no bounce. Anyway, I want to give a shout out to our headliner, Conan O'Brien. I, I, I was just talking to Ed, and I understand that when the Correspondence Association was considering Conan for this gig, they were faced with that age-old dilemma, uh, do you offer it to him now or wait for five years and then give it to Jimmy Fallon? <laughs> that was a little harsh. I, I love Conan. And of course, the White House press corps is here. I know CNN has taken some knocks lately, but the fact is I admire their commitment to cover all sides of a story, just in case one of them happens to be accurate. <laughs> some of my former advisors have switched over to the dark side. For example, David Axelrod now works for MSNBC which is a nice change of pace since MSNBC used to work for David Axelrod. <laughs> the History Channel is not here. I guess they were embarrassed about the whole Obama is a devil thing. <laughs> of course, that never kept Fox News from showing up. They actually thought the comparison was not fair to Satan. <laughs> but the problem is, is that the, the media landscape is changing so rapidly. Uh, you can't keep up with it. Uh, uh, I mean, I remember when BuzzFeed was just something I did in college around 2 a.m. Recently, though, I found a new favorite source for political news. These guys are great. I think everybody here should check it out. They tell it like it is. It's called WhiteHouse.gov. <laughs> I cannot get enough of it. The fact is, I, I really do respect the press. Uh, I recognize that the press and I have different jobs to do. Uh, my job is to be president. Uh, your job is to keep me humble. Frankly, I think I'm doing my job better. <laughs> But part of the problem is everybody is so cynical. I mean, we're constantly feeding cynicism, suspicion, conspiracies. You remember a few months ago, uh, my administration put out a photograph of me going skeet shooting at Camp David? You remember that? And, and a, uh, quite a number of people insisted that this had been photoshopped. But tonight I have something to confess. You were right. Guys, can we show them the actual photo?
We were just trying to tone it down a little bit. <laughs> that was an awesome day. <laughs> there are other new players in the media landscape as well, like Super PACs. Did you know that Sheldon Adelson spent $100 million of his own money last year on negative ads? You've got to really dislike me <laughs> to spend that kind of money. I mean, that's Oprah money. <laughs> you could buy an island and call it Obama for that kind of money. <laughs> Sheldon would have been better off offering me $100 million to drop out of the race. I, I, I probably wouldn't have taken it, but I thought about it. <laughs> Michelle would have taken it. <laughs> you think I'm joking? <laughs> I know Republicans are still sorting out what happened in 2012, but uh, one thing they all agree on is they need to do a better job reaching out to minorities. And, and, and look, call me self-centered, but I can think of one minority they could start with. <laughs> Hello? Just think, me of a, think of me as a trial run, you know? <laughs> See how it goes. <laughs> If they won't come to me, I will come to them. Recently, I had dinner. It's been well publicized. I had, I had dinner with a number of the uh, Republican senators. Uh, and, and I'll admit it, it wasn't easy. Uh, I proposed a toast. It died in committee. <laughs> of course, even after I've done all this, some folks still don't, don't think I spend enough time with Congress. Why don't you get a drink with Mitch McConnell, they ask. Really? <laughs> Why don't you get a drink with Mitch McConnell? <laughs> I'm sorry. I get frustrated sometimes. I am not giving up. In fact, I'm taking my charm offensive on the road. A Texas barbecue with Ted Cruz. Kentucky bluegrass concert with Rand Paul. And a book burning with Michelle Bachman. <laughs> my charm offensive has helped me learn some interesting things about what's going on in Congress. It turns out absolutely nothing. <laughs> but the point of my charm offensive is simple. We need to make progress on some important issues. Take the sequester. Republicans fell in love with this thing. And now they can't stop talking about how much they hate it. It's like we're trapped in a Taylor Swift album. One senator who has reached across the aisle recently is Marco Rubio, uh, but I don't know about 2016. I mean, the guy has not even finished a single term in the Senate, and he thinks he's ready to be president. <laughs> Kids these days. I, on the other end, have run my last campaign. On Thursday, uh, as Ed mentioned, I went to the opening of the Bush Presidential Library in Dallas. Uh, it was a wonderful event, and that inspired me to get started on my own legacy, uh, which will actually begin uh, by uh, building uh, another edifice right next to the Bush Library. Can we show that, please?
I'm also hard at work on plans for the Obama Library, and some have suggested that uh, we put it in my birthplace, but I'd rather keep it in the United States. <laughs> Did anybody not see that joke coming? <laughs> Show of hands. Only Gallup. <laughs> Maybe Dick Morris. <laughs> now, uh, speaking of presidents and their legacies, I, I want to acknowledge uh, a wonderful friend, Steven Spielberg and Daniel Day-Lewis, uh, who are here tonight. Um, we had a, a screening of their most recent film, Lincoln, uh, which was an extraordinary film. Uh, I am a little nervous, though, about Stephen's uh, next project. Uh, I saw a behind-the-scenes look on HBO. Uh, well, let's just check it out. Roll the tape. So, uh, It's a remarkable transformation. Um, do I really sound like that, though, honey? Well, um, you know, Groucho Marx once said, uh, and, and Senator Cruz, that's Groucho Marx, not Carl. That's the other guy. Um, Groucho Marx once told an audience, uh, before I speak, I have something important to say. And along those same lines, I want to close on a more serious note. Uh, obviously, there's been no shortage of news uh, to cover over these past few weeks. And these have been some very hard days for too many of our citizens. Uh, even as we gather here tonight, uh, our th thoughts are not far from the people of Boston and the people of West Texas. Uh, there are families in the Midwest who are coping with some terrible floods. So we've had some difficult days. But even when the days seem darkest, we have seen humanity shine at its brightest. We've seen first responders and National Guardsmen who dashed into danger, law enforcement officers who lived their oath to serve and to protect, and everyday Americans who are opening their homes and their hearts to perfect strangers. And we also saw journalists at their best especially those who took the time to wade upstream through the torrent of digital rumors to chase down leads and verify facts and painstakingly put the pieces together to inform and to educate and to tell stories that demanded to be told. If anyone wonders, for example, whether newspapers are a thing of the past, all you need to do was to pick up or log on to papers like the Boston Globe. It's when they're... When their communities and the wider world needed them most, they were there, making sense of events that might at first blush seem beyond our comprehension. And that's what great journalism is, and that's what great journalists do. And that's why, for example, Pete Williams' new nickname around the NBC newsroom is Big Poppy. Um, And in these past few weeks, uh, as I've gotten a chance to meet many of the first responders and the police officers and volunteers uh, who raced to help when hardship hits, uh, I was reminded, uh, as I'm always reminded when I meet our men and women in uniform, uh, whether they're in war theater here back home or at Walter Reed, uh, Bethesda, uh, I'm reminded that all these folks, they don't do it to be honored. They don't do it to be celebrated. They do it because they love their families, and they love their neighborhoods, and they love their country. And so these men and women should inspire all of us in this room to live up to those same standards, to be worthy of their trust, to do our jobs with the same fidelity and the same integrity and the same sense of purpose and the same love of country. 
Because if we're only focused on profits or ratings or polls, then we're contributing to the cynicism that so many people feel right now. And so, those of us in this room tonight, uh, we are incredibly lucky. And the fact is, we can do better. All of us. Those of us in public office, those of us in the press, those in, uh, who produce entertainment for our kids, those with power, those with influence, all of us, including myself, we can strive to value those things that I suspect led most of us to do the work that we do in the first place, because we believed in something that was true. And we believed in service and the idea that we can have a lasting positive impact on the lives of the people around us. And that's our obligation. That's a task we should gladly embrace on behalf of all those folks who are counting on us, on behalf of this country that's given us so much. So thank you all to the White House Correspondents for the great work you do. God bless you all. May God bless the United States of America. Thank you so much. Everybody, please have a seat. Have a seat. Um, before I get started, uh, can we get the new presidential setup out here? <laughs> it's worked before. That's more like it. It is great to be back. What a year, huh? I usually start these dinners with a few self-deprecating jokes. After, After my, my stellar 2013, what could I possibly talk about? <laughs> I admit it. Last year was rough. Sheesh. <laughs> at, at one point, things got so bad the 47% called Mitt Romney to apologize. <laughs> of course, we rolled out healthcare.gov. That could have gone better. <laughs> In 2008, my slogan was, yes, we can. In 2013, my slogan was, Control, alt, delete. <laughs> On the plus side, they did turn the launch of healthcare.gov into one of the year's biggest movies. <laughs> but rather than dwell on the past, I would like to pivot to this dinner. Let's welcome our headliner this evening, Joel McHale. On Community, Joel plays a preening, self-obsessed narcissist. So this dinner must be a real change of pace for you. I want to thank the White House Correspondents Association for hosting us here tonight. Uh, I am happy to be here. Uh, even though I am a little jet-lagged from my trip to Malaysia. The links we have to go to to get CNN coverage these days. <laughs> I think they're still searching for their table. MSNBC is here. They're a little overwhelmed. They've never seen an audience this big before. <laughs> but look, everybody is trying to keep up with this incredibly fast-changing media landscape. For example, I got a lot of grief on cable news for promoting Obamacare to young people uh, on Between Two Ferns. 
but that's what young people like to watch. And to be fair, I am not the first person on television between two potted plants. Sometimes I do feel disrespected by you reporters, but that's okay. Seattle Seahawk cornerback Richard Sherman is here tonight, and he gave me he gave me some great tips on how to handle it. Jake Tapper, don't you ever talk about me like that. I'm the best president in the game. What do you think, Richard? Was that good? A little more feeling next time? While we're talking sports, just last month, uh, a wonderful story. An American won the Boston Marathon for the first time in 30 years. <laughs> Which was inspiring, uh, and only fair since a Kenyan has been president for the last six. <laughs> we have to even things up. <laughs> we have some other athletes here tonight, including Olympic snowboarding gold medalist Jamie Anderson is here. We're proud of her. Incredibly talented young lady. Michelle and I watch the Olympics. We cannot believe what these folks do. Death-defying feats. Haven't seen somebody pull a 180 that fast since Rand Paul disinvited that Nevada rancher from this dinner. <laughs> As a general rule, things don't uh, end well if the sentence starts, let me tell you something I know about the Negro. <laughs> you don't really need to hear the rest of it. Just a tip for you. <laughs> Don't start your sentence that way. <laughs> Speaking of Rand Paul, Colorado legalized marijuana this year. Uh, an interesting social experiment. Uh, I do hope it doesn't lead to a whole lot of paranoid people who think that the federal government's out to get them and <laughs> listening to their phone calls. That would be a problem. <laughs> and speaking of conservative heroes, the Koch brothers bought a table here tonight, but as usual, they used a shadowy right-wing organization as a front. Hello, Fox News. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm just kidding. Let's face it, Fox, you'll miss me when I'm gone. It will be harder to convince the American people that Hillary was born in Kenya. A lot of us really are concerned about the way big money is influencing our politics. I remember when a super PAC was just me buying Marlboro 100s instead of regulars. <laughs> of course, now that it's 2014, Washington is obsessed on the midterms. Folks are saying that with my sagging poll numbers, my fellow Democrats don't really want me campaigning with them. And I don't think that's true, although I did notice the other day that uh, Sasha needed a speaker at career day and she invited Bill Clinton. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was a little hurt by that. <laughs> Both sides are doing whatever it takes to win. It's a ruthless game. Republicans... <laughs> This is a true story. Republicans actually brought in a group of consultants 
to teach their candidates how to speak to women. <laughs> this is true. Uh, and I don't know if it'll work with women, but I understand that America's teenage boys are signing up to run for the Senate in droves. <laughs> anyway, while you guys focus on the horse race, I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to be focused on everyday Americans. Just yesterday, I read a heartbreaking letter. Uh, you know, I get letters from uh, folks around the country every day. I get 10 that I read. This, this one got to me. A Virginia man who's been stuck in the same part-time job for years, no respect from his boss, no chance to get ahead. Uh, I, I really wish Eric Cantor would stop writing me. <laughs> You can just pick up the phone, Eric. <laughs> and I'm feeling sorry, believe it or not, for the Speaker of the House as well. These days, the House Republicans actually give John Boehner a harder time than they give me. Uh, which means orange really is the new black. <laughs> given up the idea of working with Congress. In fact, two weeks ago, Senator Ted Cruz and I, we uh, got a bill done together. And, and I have to say, the signing ceremony was something special. Got a picture of it, I think. I, I, look, I know. Washington seems more dysfunctional than ever. Gridlock has gotten so bad in this town, you have to wonder, what do we do to piss off Chris Christie so bad? <laughs> One issue, for example, we haven't been able to agree on is unemployment insurance. Republicans continue to refuse to extend it. Uh, you know what? I, I am beginning to think they've got a point. If you want to get paid while not working, you should have to run for Congress just like everybody else. <laughs> of course, there is one thing that keeps Republicans busy. They have tried more than 50 times to repeal Obamacare. Despite that, Eight million people signed up for health care in the first open enrollment. <laughs> Which does lead one to ask, how well does Obamacare have to work before you don't want to repeal it? What if everybody's cholesterol drops to 120? <laughs> what if your yearly checkup came with tickets to a Clippers game? <laughs> not, not the old Don Sterling Clippers, the new Oprah Clippers. Would that be good enough? What if it gave Mitch McConnell a pulse? <laughs> what is it going to take? <laughs> anyway, this year I've promised to use more executive actions to get things done without Congress. My critics call this the imper imperial presidency. Truth is, I just show up every day at my office and do my job. You got a picture of this, I think. <laughs> you would think they'd appreciate a more assertive approach, considering that the new conservative darling is none other than Vladimir Putin. Last year, Pat Buchanan said, Putin's headed straight for the Nobel Peace Prize. He said this. Now, I know it sounds crazy, uh, but to be fair, they give those to just about anybody these days. <laughs> so it could happen. But it's not just uh, Pat. Rudy Giuliani said, Putin is what you call a leader. Mike Huckabee and Sean Hannity keep talking about his bare chest, which is kind of weird. <laughs>
Look it up. They talk about it a lot. <laughs> it is strange to think that I have just two and a half years left in this office. Um, everywhere I look, there are reminders that I only hold this job temporarily. <laughs> but uh, it's a long time between now and 2016, and anything can happen. You may have heard the other day, Hillary had to dodge a flying shoe at a press conference. <laughs> I love that picture. <laughs> Regardless of what happens, I've run my last campaign, and I'm beginning to think about my legacy. Uh, some of you know, uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel recently announced he's naming a high school after me in Chicago, which is, is extremely humbling. Uh, I was even more flattered to hear Rick Perry, who's here tonight, is doing the same thing in Texas. Take a look. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. It means a lot to me. And I intend to enjoy all the free time that I will have George W. Bush took up painting after he left office, which inspired me to take up my own artistic sign. I, I, I'm sure we've got a shot of this. Maybe not. The joke doesn't work without the slide. Oh, well. Assume that it was funny. Does this happen to you, Joel? <laughs> it does, okay. On a more serious note, uh, tonight reminds us that we really are lucky to live in a country where reporters get to give a head of state a hard time on a daily basis, and then once a year give him or her the chance, at least, to try to return the favor. Uh, but we also know that not every journalist or photographer or crew member is so fortunate. Because even as we celebrate uh, the free press tonight, our thoughts are with those in places around the globe, like Ukraine and Afghanistan and Syria and Egypt, who risk uh, everything, in some cases even give their lives, to report the news. And what tonight also reminds us is that the fight for full and fair access goes beyond the chance to ask a question. Uh, as Steve mentioned, decades ago, an African-American who wanted to cover his or her president might be barred from journalism school, burdened by Jim Crow, and once in Washington, banned from press conferences. Uh, but after years of effort, black editors and publishers began meeting with FDR's press secretary, Steve Early. And then they met with the president himself, who declared that a black reporter would get a credential. Uh, and even when Harry McAlpin made history as the first African-American to attend a presidential news conference, he wasn't always welcomed by the other reporters. But he was welcomed by the president, who told him, I'm glad to see you, McAlpin, and I'm very happy to have you here. Now, that su uh, sentiment might have worn off once Harry asked him a question or two. Uh, and Harry's battles continued, but he made history. And we're so proud of uh, Sherman uh, and his family for being here tonight, and the White House Correspondents Association for creating the scholarship in Harry's name. For over 100 years, even as the White House Correspondents Association has told the story of America's progress, you've lived it too, gradually allowing equal access to women, and minorities, and gays, and Americans with disabilities. And yes, radio and television and internet reporters as well. And through it all, you've helped make sure that even as societies change, our fundamental commitment to the interaction between those who govern and those who ask questions uh, doesn't change. And as Jay will attest, it's a legacy you carry on enthusiastically every single day. Uh, and because this is the 100th anniversary of the Correspondents Association, uh, I actually recorded uh, an additional brief video thanking all of you for your hard work. Can we run the video? Congratulations. What's going on? 
I, I, I was told this would work. Uh, does anybody know how to fix this? Oh, thank you. You got it? I got this. I see it all the time. There. That's Congratulations your to the White House Correspondents Association. Here's to 100 <laughs> more terrific years. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. And God bless everybody. Welcome to the White House Correspondents' Dinner, the night when Washington celebrates itself. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. And welcome to the fourth quarter of my presidency. It's true, I... That was Michelle cheering. Fact is, I feel more loose and relaxed than ever. Those Joe Biden shoulder massages, they're like magic. You should try one. Oh, you have. I am determined to make the most of every moment I have left. Now, after the midterm elections, my advisors asked me, Mr. President, do you have a bucket list? And I said, well, I have something that rhymes with bucket list. <laughs> Take executive action on immigration? Bucket. New climate regulations? Bucket. It's the right thing to do. And my new attitude is paying off. Look at my Cuba policy. The Castro brothers are here tonight. Welcome to America, amigos. Que pasa? What? It's the Castros from Texas? Oh. Hi, Iowa Queen. Hi, Julian. Anyway, uh, being president is never easy. I still have to fix a broken immigration system, issue veto threats, negotiate with Iran, all while finding time to pray five times a day. <laughs> Which is strenuous. And it is no wonder that people keep pointing out how the presidency has aged me. I look so old, John Boehner's already invited Netanyahu to speak at my funeral. <laughs> Meanwhile, Michelle hasn't aged today. I ask her what her secret is, she just says, fresh fruits and vegetables. <laughs> it's aggravating. <laughs> Fact is, though, at this point, my legacy is finally beginning to take shape. The economy is getting better. Nine in 10 Americans now have health coverage. Today, thanks to Obamacare, you no longer have to worry about losing your insurance if you lose your job. You're welcome, Senate Democrats. <laughs> now, look, it, it is true I have not managed to make everybody happy. Six years into my presidency, some people still say I'm arrogant and aloof condescending. Some people are so dumb. No wonder I don't meet with them. And that's not all people say about me. A few weeks ago, Dick Cheney says he thinks I'm the worst president of his lifetime, which is interesting because I think Dick Cheney is the worst president of my lifetime.
Quite a coincidence. I mean, everybody's got something to say these days. Mike Huckabee recently said, people shouldn't join our military until a true conservative is elected president. Think about that. It was so outrageous, 47 ayatollahs wrote us a letter trying to explain to Huckabee how our system works. <laughs> it gets worse. Just this week, Michelle Bachman actually, actually predicted that I would bring about the biblical end of days. Now that's a legacy. That's big. I mean, Lincoln, Washington, they didn't do that. But, you know, I just had to put this stuff aside. I've got to stay focused on my job uh, because for many Americans, this is still a time of deep uncertainty. Uh, for example, I have, a, I have one friend. Just a few weeks ago, she was making millions of dollars a year, and she's now living out of a van in Iowa. Meanwhile, back here in our nation's capital, we're always dealing with new challenges. I'm happy to report that the Secret Service, thanks to some excellent reporting by White House correspondents, uh, they're really focusing on uh, some of the issues that have come up. And they finally figured out a foolproof way to keep people off my lawn. There we go. It works. And it's not just fence jumpers. Some of you know a few months ago a drone crash landed out back. That was pretty serious, but don't worry. We've installed a new state-of-the-art security system. <laughs> you know what? I, 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 let me set the record straight. I, you know, I tease Joe sometimes, but he has been at my side for seven years. I love that man. He's not just a great vice president, he is a great friend. I, we've gotten so close in some places in Indiana, they won't serve us pizza anymore. <laughs> I want to thank our host for the evening, the Chicago girl, the incredibly talented Cicely Strong. On Saturday Night Live, Sicily impersonates CNN anchor Brooke Baldwin, which is surprising because usually the only people impersonating journalists on CNN are journalists on CNN. <laughs> ABC is here with some of the stars from their big new comedy, Blackish. It, it, uh, it's a great show, but uh, I have to give ABC fair warning. Uh, being blackish only makes you popular for so long. Trust me. Uh, there's a shelf life to that thing. As always, uh, the reporters here had a lot to cover over the last year. Here on the East Coast, one big story was the brutal winter. The polar vortex caused so many record lows, they renamed it MSNBC. <laughs> but of course, let's face it, there is one issue on every reporter's minds, and that is 2016. Already we've seen some missteps. It turns out Jeb Bush identified himself as Hispanic back in 2009. But you know what? I, look, I understand. It's an innocent mistake. Reminds me of when I identified myself as American back in 1961.
Ted Cruz said that denying the existence of climate change made, <laughs> made him like Galileo. <laughs> now, that's not really an apt comparison. <laughs> Galileo believed the Earth revolves around the sun. Ted Cruz believes the Earth revolves around Ted Cruz. I, I, and, and just as an aside, I want to point out, when a guy who has his face on a hope poster calls you self-centered, <laughs> you know you've got a problem. <laughs> the narcissism index is creeping up a little too high. <laughs> Meanwhile, Rick Santorum announced that he would not attend the same-sex wedding of a friend or a loved one, to which gays and lesbians across the country responded, that's not going to be a problem. <laughs> Don't sweat that one. <laughs> and Donald Trump is here. Still. <laughs> anyway. It's amazing how time flies. Soon the first presidential contest will take place. And I, for one, cannot wait to see who the Koch brothers pick. <laughs> it's exciting. Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, Jeb Bush, Scott Walker. Who will finally get that red rose? <laughs> the winner gets a billion-dollar war chest. The runner-up gets to be the Bachelor on the next season of The Bachelor. <laughs> I mean, seriously, a billion dollars from just two guys. Is it just me, or does that feel a little excessive? <laughs> I mean, it's almost insulting to the candidates. The, the, the Koch brothers think they need to spend a billion dollars to get folks to like one of these people. <laughs> it's got to hurt their feelings a little bit. And look, I know I've raised a lot of money, too, but in all fairness, my middle name is Hussein. <laughs> What's their excuse? <laughs> the trail hasn't been easy for my fellow Democrats, either. Uh, as we all know, Hillary's private emails got her in trouble. Frankly, I thought it was going to be her private Instagram account that was going to cause her bigger problems. <laughs> Hillary kicked things off by going completely unrecognized at a Chipotle. Not to be outdone, Martin O'Malley kicked things off by going completely unrecognized at a Martin O'Malley campaign event. <laughs> And Bernie Sanders might run. I, I like Bernie. Bernie's an interesting guy. Apparently, some folks really want to see a pot-smoking socialist in the White House. <laughs> we could get a third Obama term after all. <laughs> could happen. Anyway, as always, I want to close on a more serious note. You know, I often joke about tensions between me and the press, but uh, honestly, what they say doesn't bother me. I understand we've got an adversarial system. I'm a mellow sort of guy. And that's why I invited Luther, my anger translator, to join me here tonight. your lily white butts. <laughs> In our fast-changing world, traditions like the White House Correspondents' Dinner are important. I mean, really? What is this dinner? <laughs> and why am I required to come to it? <laughs> Jeb Bush, do you really want to do this? Because despite our differences, we count on the press 
to shed light on the most important issues of the day. And we can count on Fox News to terrify old white people with some nonsense. <laughs> Sharia law is coming to Cleveland, run for the damn hills. Y'all was ridiculous. We won't always see eye to eye. Oh, and CNN, thank you so much for the wall-to-wall -wall Ebola coverage. For two whole weeks, we were one step away from the walking dead. And then y'all got up and just moved on to the next day. That was awesome. Oh, and by the way, just if you haven't noticed, you don't have Ebola! But I still deeply appreciate the work that you do. Y'all remember when I had that big old hole in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, and then I plugged it? Remember that? Which Obama's Katrina was that one? Was, it, was that 19, or was it, what, 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 was it 20? Because I came around, I can't remember. Protecting our democracy is more important than ever. For example, the Supreme Court ruled that the donor who gave Ted Cruz $6 million was just exercising free speech. Yeah, it's the kind of speech like this. I just wasted $6 million. <laughs> and it's not just Republicans. Hillary will have to raise huge sums of money, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she gonna get that money. She gonna get all, all the money. <laughs> Khaleesi is coming to Westeros. <laughs> so watch out. The nonstop focus on billionaire donors creates real problems for our democracy. And that's why we run it for a third time! No, no, no we're not. We're not? No. Who the hell said that? <laughs> but we do need to stay focused on some big challenges, like climate change. Hey, listen, y'all, if you haven't noticed, California is bone dry. <laughs> it looked like a trailer for the new Mad Max movie up in there. Y'all think that Bradley Cooper came here because he wants to talk to Chuck Todd? <laughs> he needed a glass of water! <laughs> Come on! The science is clear. The science is clear. Nine out of the 10 hottest years ever came in the last decade. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I do know how to count to 10. <laughs> Rising seas, more violent storms. You got mosquitoes. Sweaty people on the train, stinking it up. It's just nasty. I mean, look at, us what, look at what's happening right now. Every serious scientist says we need to act. The Pentagon says it's a national security risk. Miami floods on a sunny day, and instead of doing anything about it, we've got elected officials throwing snowballs in the Senate. Okay, okay, Mr. It's a, okay I, I think they got it, bro. I, it is crazy. <laughs> What about our kids? What kind of stupid, short-sighted, irresponsible bull? Whoa, 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 hey! What? what? Okay, no, hey. What? All, all due respect, sir, you don't need an anger translator. You need a counselor. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm, I'm out of here, man. I to get into all this. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Luther, my anger translator, ladies and gentlemen. Now that I got that off my chest. <laughs> you know, investigative journalism, explanatory journalism, journalism that exposes corruption and injustice and gives voice to the different and the marginalized, the voiceless, that's power. It's a privilege. It's as important to America's trajectory, uh, to our values, our ideals, than anything that we could do in elected office. We remember journalists we lost over the past year. Journalists like Stephen Sotloff and James Foley, murdered for nothing more than trying to shine a light into some of the world's darkest corners.
We remember the journalists unjustly imprisoned around the world, including our own Jason Razan. For nine months, Jason has been imprisoned in Tehran for nothing more than writing about the hopes and the fears of the Iranian people, carrying their stories to the readers of the Washington Post in an effort to bridge our common humanity. As was already mentioned, Jason's brother Ali is here tonight, and uh, I have told him personally we will not rest until we bring him home to his family, safe and sound. These journalists and so many others view their work as more than just a profession, uh, but as a public good, an indispensable pillar of our society. So I want to give a toast to them. I raise a glass to them and to all of you with the words of the American foreign correspondent Dorothy Thompson. It is not the fact of liberty, but the way in which liberty is exercised that ultimately determines whether liberty itself survives. Thank you for your devotion to exercising our liberty and to telling our American story. God bless you. God bless the United States of America.